Acts 23, 11. So last time, uh, here's where we're located, just to give you a, 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 a situation report here. So, so Paul, uh, after finishing, he's finished up his third missionary journey, visiting these communities that he's established throughout uh, the Mediterranean, uh, especially in uh, modern day Greece. And he also, uh, while he's doing that, is taking up a collection, <clears throat> which Luke is going to mention here, uh, I think in 23 or 24. Um, he's taking up a collection for the poor in Judea. So he's taking, and it's a, an attempt to show, show solidarity among the Christian churches, even though they're divided in terms of geographical location, Jew versus Gentile, et cetera, this collection uh, for the poor in Judea is, a, is an important sign for Paul, we learned from his letters, that of the unity of the church. So he, Luke doesn't mention it very much. He mentions it only kind of in passing. <clears throat> So Paul is collecting the uh, collecting from the, the churches. He also has representatives from some of these churches traveling with him, including Luke. Uh, he picks up Luke again as he's finishing his third missionary journey and making his way to Jerusalem. He finally gets to Jerusalem, and now uh, he lands in Caesarea. They they make their way, the port and make their way uh, down to Jerusalem. Um, and then we don't really hear anything more about the, who's with him, except for the fact that when Paul gets to Jerusalem, uh, almost immediately he meets with the apostles there. They say to him, look, there's a misperception that you are uh, teaching Jews to disregard the law. In order to combat this, here's an idea. We have these men going to take a Nazarite vow at the temple. Why don't you go with them to the temple, sponsor them, and also complete your days of purification as you return from these foreign Gentile lands? Paul agrees. He goes with them. And the Jews from Asia who are there, now that, remember this is a uh, around the time of Pentecost, one of the great pilgrimage feasts. So some of Jews from Asia who Paul has managed to tick off, especially in Ephesus and that area, uh, recognize him at the temple in Jerusalem, see him on the streets of Jerusalem, not in the temple, but in the streets of Jerusalem with Trophimus, uh, a Gentile convert uh, uh, from the Ephesus area. <laughs> and they assume uh, with a kind of bad faith, bad intention, that Paul has brought Trophimus into the temple as well, because Paul is just letting these Gentiles come in. He's telling people the law doesn't matter anymore. So probably Paul would do that too. He would probably bring this Gentile into the temple area, which was explicitly forbidden and deserved the death penalty. But there's no evidence Paul actually did that. They assume he did that. Now, all this takes place within, uh, even now, the point we're, we're at now, after Paul um, uh, has been uh, taken up. So, you know, the Jews see him in the temple. They accuse him of this. This kind of riot starts to break out. The Roman soldiers come down from the, the fortress, the garrison. <laughs> they pluck him out. Paul reveals that he's a Roman citizen. He appeals to Caesar. Uh, the centurion who's in command uh, of the, uh, basically in command of Jerusalem in the fort there, he calls together the Sanhedrin, not in an official meeting, but the but unofficially to kind of hear what's going on. What are the charges against this guy? How can I uh, um, adjudicate this case? So that's where we are now. And all of this has taken place less than two weeks since Paul stepped foot there, right? So all of this has happened very quickly. Um, <clears throat> so here we go, verse 11, chapter 23. So in the previous, immediately uh, previous section, the Roman soldiers bring him down to this kind of informal meeting of the Sanhedrin. Um, and the, the Romans are trying to get an understanding of what is it exactly you have against this guy? Because they still don't understand. <clears throat> they, un they kind of assume it's something to do with their law, which they're not particularly interested in the intricacies of uh, internal disputes within Judaism. Um, which is another good point. We're going to see here throughout that... Luke is consistently demonstrating on purpose that this is an internal dispute within Judaism. So just like the dispute between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Christians, in other words, it's internal dispute within Judaism, placing Christianity, therefore, as a part of Judaism. It is not a new religion. You know, Luke is making that very clear. This is, he's basically telling the Romans, look, this is an internal Jewish dispute uh, there's nothing seditious going on here, nothing you need to be concerned about from the Roman perspective, <clears throat> but this is an internal Jewish dispute. 
He wants to identify for the Roman readers Christianity as a part of Judaism, not a new religion, <clears throat> as we were talking about earlier. So Paul, he sees the situation when he gets there uh, before the Sanhedrin, and he sees that there are uh, some Sadducees there and some Pharisees. And as we talked about last time, he kind of throws this hand grenade in there, knowing it's going to cause this big dispute. Uh, he, he tells the Pharisees, I'm a Pharisee. I'm being persecuted because like you, I believe in the resurrection. And so the kind of there's chaos erupts and again they have to whisk him out of this and rush him back to the fortress into a kind of protective custody all right that's where we are verse 11 but the following night meaning the night following that day that that night the lord stood by him and said be of good cheer paul for as you have testified for me in jerusalem so you must also bear witness at rome so and this was in fact paul's desire paul's desire is to bear witness, is to preach the gospel to Caesar himself. Paul has, you know, his vision, his mission is not, uh, is, is the whole world, literally the whole world. I mean, for his time, the Roman empire was the whole world. So, you know, he's not satisfied with, well, I want to found a few more churches here and there. And, and no, no, he has this big, hairy, audacious, audacious uh, goal, as they say, a BHAG. You know, he, he wants to convert the whole known world, the whole Roman world. And so here, uh, Christ bears witness that, that he blesses Paul's intent, that this is, in fact, from God. This is, this is the plan. <clears throat> Verse 12, and when it was day, so the next morning, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Now, there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy. All right, so this, they, ba they bound themselves under an oath. This was very common. Uh, they would take an oath such as, you know, I we will not eat or drink until, until such and such happens. Even Jesus takes an oath that I will not drink of this cup again until I come into my kingdom. <clears throat> Right. So and th these were common oaths that people took uh, invoking a deity. So not only within Judaism, but in the ancient Mediterranean world in general. Um, and now the question is, as we're going to see, they fail. <clears throat> they're not able to kill Paul. So then the question is, well, what happens? They, to they took an oath. They're not going to eat or drink until they kill Paul and they're not able to do it. Does that mean they're going to starve to death or die of thirst? No, it was the what would happen is if their oath couldn't be fulfilled then there was an appropriate sacrifice that they would offer at the temple so they would go so instead of fulfilling the oath as they had promised they would come and they would make an offering at the temple to atone for their failure to to keep this oath that they had made in god's name problem solved <clears throat> but but anyway it's a way to show that they they are very serious in this intention verse 14 they came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great oath that we will eat nothing until we have killed Paul. Now you, therefore, together with the council, suggest to the commander, together with the Sanhedrin, the Jewish elders and leaders, suggest to the commander of the garrison, the Roman commander, Centurion, uh, that he be brought down to you tomorrow, not Centurion, sorry, the Roman commander, <clears throat> that he be brought down to you tomorrow as though you were going to make further inquiries concerning him but we are ready to kill him before he comes near. So all right, they're trying, this is their, this is their plan. They're going to say, okay, you guys make a pretense that, you know, you, you have more questions for him. The Roman, uh, uh, the, the Roman leader will, will buy it, you know, try to get to the bottom of what the dispute is concerning Paul. As this, as the Roman soldiers are bringing him from his protective custody in the fortress, which is in the northeast corner to the, where the council typically got together, which was on the kind of southwest uh, area of the temple, outside the Temple Mount. It was probably only a kilometer or so, <clears throat> but there were some sections they would have to go through where it, was, where it would get narrow. So there was, certain, there was for certain some area they had in mind that they could lay in wait while they go by. And he would be accompanied, and they knew that he was going to be accompanied by Roman soldiers bringing him there. So they were, they were ready to lose at least a couple of men's lives uh, in doing this potentially as they attacked him. But they were ready to do this. <clears throat> so they say, "This is what we need to do: call him down there, and on his way, he won't make it there." Sixteen. So when Paul's sister's son, Paul's sister's son, so Paul's nephew, and this is. 
you know, this just kind of comes out of nowhere. There's no reference to uh, to Paul's sister or her son anywhere else, and there's really nothing else said about it. So this has attracted all kinds of interest and curiosity and speculation over the centuries. Who who is this? What does she living in Jerusalem? Who's the nephew? Why are they there? But if Paul's from Tarsus in Cilicia, why are they there? Uh, we don't know. But the speculation is that perhaps is that Paul's family probably uh, came from a wealthy, uh, a wealthier family uh, up in Tarsus. Uh, this was how his father had managed to earn uh, Roman citizenship for them, because he had perhaps he had been freed uh, as a as a Jewish slave at some point, perhaps under Pompey, uh, and then had done well for himself as a free man, had made some money and somehow got Roman citizenship. Uh, and that when Paul went to study with Gamaliel uh, for rabbinical studies in Jerusalem, that perhaps Paul didn't just go by himself, perhaps the family moved with him down there. We don't know, but kind of seems like Paul's sister is living in Jerusalem or the area. Now, the other thing here is, um, you know, Paul says in Philippians 3.8, in his own letter, he says that for Christ's sake, he has suffered the loss of all things. And so many commentators think that what he means by this is that he was disinherited by his family. He suffered the loss of all things uh, for proclaiming Jesus as the Jewish Messiah that they expected. And that, so perhaps though, Paul's sister still has some affection for him, even if he's been disinherited. Uh, there's perhaps some kind of connection there, some affection. And so when the nephew heard of the ambush, as it says here in 16, so when Paul's sister's son heard of their ambush, he and now how does he know about it? We don't know. There's also all kinds of speculation, but somehow he hears about it. He went and entered the barracks and told Paul. In other words, he went to where Paul was being held in protective custody. Now, this seems maybe a little strange to us because, well, Paul's in prison. Well, it's kind of a gray area. You know, he's, he's, he's in protective custody, but because he's a Roman citizen and he hasn't really been officially charged with anything, it's, it's kind of like a house detention, something like that. But he has a great deal of freedom, usually in these cases, uh, you know, they would, uh, visitors would be allowed. Um, Paul had some kind of status. So it's not like a, a, a strict prison, like we might think of. So he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. So in other words, somehow he gets in, uh, he may have sometimes family would have to bribe the guard, uh, maybe bring him some food or something. Maybe not. Maybe the, if the guards were on good relations with the, the one being held, they would just let them pass. But somehow it seems pretty, he pretty easily gets in and talks to Paul where he's being held and tells him about this ambush. 17. Then Paul called one of the centurions, so one of the officers. And we imagine, we think at this time that there were about maybe 500 Roman soldiers stationed in Jerusalem at this fortress. <clears throat> uh, so you would have had, you know, maybe five centurions commanding approximately 180 to 100 soldiers each. Uh, so these are one of the, this is probably one of the five, six centurions who are there, the, the under uh, kind of the lieutenants to the captain who is running it. And Paul calls one of the centurions to himself, which is kind of interesting. And he, he asks he, and, and said, take this young man to the commander for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the commander and said, Paul, the prisoner called me to him and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you. So it's kind of interesting this, that Paul has this kind of gravitas, even though he's a prisoner, he's able to call the second, third in command and say, hey, hey, come over here, do me a favor, take, <laughs> take this nephew and uh, go take him and go see the commander. And he does it. Uh, so it, it's kind of interesting. You wouldn't, if, if Paul were uh, a prisoner in the normal sense we think of it, he wouldn't have that kind of um, authority. But again, because he's a Roman citizen, he's accorded cert a certain respect and deference. Father, can I ask something? <laughs> sure. Go ahead, Vina, you want to go? I, I just had, I, the thought occurred to me is, I wonder, Father, where does um, St. Luke gather this information? We know he had many, many sources is in the, the different studies of the 
origins of his uh, gospel and 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 the book of acts it, do you have any information about that oh there's no that's that's a great question there's a lot a lot of speculation about that especially in this part um yeah i mean scholars will you know this is one of those things a lot of ink has been spilled um you know, <laughs> Generally, the, the answer, the, the consensus is that, you know, they give them these kind of fancy technical names. Uh, they call it his Pauline source. So they attribute this to his Pauline source, which can mean Paul himself. Um, now, it's kind of unclear at this point, but Luke did seem to travel with him to Caesarea, to Jerusalem. It's only been, it's been less than two weeks since they arrived. Now, Luke's kind of disappeared. We don't have any wee passages at this point, but I think it would be pretty safe to assume Luke is still in Jerusalem. <clears throat> I don't know why he would have left, and so there was some fear that he was going to be arrested. So, you know, and if, and if, as we know, not just in this case, but in general for prisoners of this kind in the Roman world, <clears throat> Luke would have had easy access to Paul uh, to go visit him. So, you know, it, to me, the most obvious answer is that he heard it from Paul himself, not that he was there, but that Paul related the substance of what happened to him it, it, mm -hmm. firsthand or perhaps secondhand through someone, mm -hmm. one of the others who was there in Jerusalem. So, and probably monitoring everything at this point, Father, because if he traveled with him, they were, I'm sure, very aware of every every detail that was going on in the life of Paul at this point because he is in prison and he might be condemned I'm sure they followed every step of the way yeah. to know what the, what the procedure was going to be I would if I were a friend of Paul and I traveled with him I would know that his nephew came in and he did this and I mean it, the definitely they were following every detail of his life they at were, this point were, yeah they were family they were I mean it's like yeah. imagine if uh I don't know, like Father Paul, you know, let's our Father Paul here, let's say, you know, he got arrested for preaching the gospel or something. And, you know, all of us in the church community would know what's going on. You know, we would tell each other, oh, sure. the lawyer came to see him and they're putting this charge against him or, you know, it's nothing, nothing different from from back then. <clears throat> all right. So, yeah, now this part's interesting. 19. Uh, one other, I think, I, uh, Father. Yeah, go ahead. The longest ago. The documentary that I saw was talking about that the garrison in Jerusalem was about no less than 10,000 soldiers. It was a huge garrison because of the revolt that they were always afraid. And that for them to, I, they were talking about really the location of the temple. That was the, 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 uh, the, the, that was the subject of the documentary that they did not believe the temple was where people think it was that really the garrison itself was on top of that platform because for them to house 10,000 soldiers with uh, with shops and food and rest you know they have to feed them they have to house them and so on that they the temple actually location was on the southern side uh, of of the where the temple is now i don't know when they were proving it i mean this was a recent documentary uh, that the temple was not as big as we thought it was, that, that, that the main garrison was uh, a bigger, bigger garrison than we, when, that what, from what was presumed. I haven't heard anything about anyway, that. Anyway, that's my... Yeah, I, I, yeah, anyway, that was... Anyway, I thought I'd mention it. It's a recent documentary that we've seen on, on Netflix, I think it was. Yeah, my initial reaction is... Anyway, yeah, go ahead. But I mean, yeah, they're definitely... The, the, the garrison was large because especially like during feast times or when they had to put down revolts, they would have to bring in a much larger force. But during peace times, the evidence suggests that they had about 500 people kind of permanently stationed there. All right, so, <clears throat> so if Paul manages to, he gets this centurion, he says, take this young man to your commander. So Paul, so the, the centurion does it. 19, then the commander took him, the, Paul's nephew, by the hand, went aside and asked privately, what is it that you have to tell me? Now, this scene is kind of like an endearing scene, you know, he takes him by the hand, uh, which was kind of, you know, in our culture, it seems a little strange for men, especially to like, hold hands, but uh, in other cultures and in, in Rome, it wasn't, it was a sign of, of, of friendship, of, of friendliness. And it also, people have speculated, 
probably indicates that Paul's nephew was on the younger side, you know, that he may have been, who knows, 14 or 15 or something, a, a young man uh, for those times. And so, you know, this is a very kind of the, you know, why does Luke give us this picture? Why does he add that little sketch in there of the holding by the hand? I think, you know, he's trying to show that, I, I think what he's trying to show in general, what he's trying to emphasize in general is, is uh, the positive aspects of the Romans, right? <clears throat> because remember, Luke is writing, he's not writing necessarily for a Jewish audience in Judea. He's writing mainly for Romans. And he's kind of, he wants to show how, you know, Romans like to think of themselves as kind of fair-minded, objective, um, you know, with upright morals, et cetera. This is how they like to think of themselves. And so Luke is presenting them as such and kind of in that way appealing to them when he's saying, look, when you're considering Christianity, listen, listen to the story I'm telling you about, you forget what, what you might've heard through rumors. Listen to what I'm telling you. This is the historic, I'm writing, is, this is a history book that I'm writing here. I've collected the sources meticulously. And look, the Romans who came before you, who encountered Christianity uh, at this stage, uh, were friendly, were open-minded, uh, were fair-minded. <clears throat> They didn't immediately take a hostile approach to it, so you should do the same, right? He's appealing to what's best in the in the Romans, and and by contrast, he's showing you know he's showing that the Romans follow the law, and he's showing that the Jews don't follow their own law, <clears throat> that you know they try to kill Paul without a trial, etc. So anyway, the commander looks very good here, and he, he asks and draws him in private. It's just the two of them, twenty, and he, Paul's nephew, said. The Jews have agreed to ask that you bring Paul down to the council tomorrow, as though they were going to inquire more fully about him. But do not yield to them, for more than 40 of them lie in wait for him, men who have bound themselves by an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for the promise from you. 22. So the commander let the young man depart and commanded him, tell no one that you have revealed these things to me. So, all right, now what's he going to do? So not, you know, the commander has this information. He doesn't want anyone to know that he has this information uh, because that, then they might change their plans. So what's he do? He makes, up, his, he makes his mind up quickly. He's decisive. He said, and he called for two centurions. So two of maybe the five or six officers that he has under them. And he called for two centurions saying, prepare 200 soldiers, your 100 and your 100. 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night. Now this spearman, this is kind of a disputed word. Um, it, there's not a lot of evidence for what Luke is talking about. I think it's uh, vexio lambani or something like that, meaning it, literally meaning those who hold something in their right hand, but it seems to be some kind of auxiliary troop, uh, some auxiliary troop. So in other words, it looks like he's probably sending about half of the garrison um, along with some kind of auxiliary troops who may have assisted the Romans in some way. Uh, and it seems like a large force, 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen uh, to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night, meaning around nine o'clock at night, once it got dark, 24, and provide mounts to set Paul on and bring him safely to Felix the governor. In other words, don't make Paul uh, walk, but you know, again, it's showing this kind of deference or respect for Paul as a Roman citizen, that he, he'll be under guard. He'll be, he's a prisoner, but he'll be given, he'll be able to ride, not, he won't have to march. 25, and so Felix is the governor. Okay. So Felix, the governor of this whole area of Judea, so he is in the position that Pontius Pilate had. Uh, at this year, we're, now we're talking, we're probably in around the year 58. So we're probably about 25, 30 years since uh, Jesus' crucifixion. Felix is the new governor, uh, having replaced Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate, uh, we know historically, uh, was beheaded uh, for, for poor service. Uh, apparently there were, uh, too many problems coming out of his area that he was supposed to keep quiet. And, uh, the, the, the historical account we have is that like many people who, uh, civil officials who failed to meet the, um, uh, standards of the emperor, 
you know, at, uh, in Rome, there were, uh, there were these, there's this one place where there were steps down into the Tiber River. And the, there, uh, they would actually, and it was a very kind of public place. So people who had displeased or failed the emperor, they would have their head chopped off. Uh, be, they would be beheaded at the top of these steps, and everyone would watch the head bounce down the steps into the Tiber River. And that was a, that was a, a clear uh, message to other politicians in Rome, don't make the same mistake. You know, we don't care how you do it, but... We want quiet over there, wherever you're governing, and we want them to cough up their taxes. That's what we expect from you. <clears throat> so anyway, Felix was now the new governor of this area. So uh, uh, Lysias, the, the commander in Jerusalem, it says he wrote a letter in the following manner. <clears throat> now, again, here's a question people ask, uh, how does Luke get access to this letter? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, it's, some people think that he might have actually seen uh, the letter because it says here he wrote a letter in the following manner, which in Greece says, so having this type. And some people argue that tipos could mean that it's actually having this exact type, meaning it's a, a verbatim copy and that Luke has in front of him. Or it could mean... Uh, like this in the following manner, uh, such as, because the form of this letter that he's going to read is, is if you, if we look at the surviving letters between Roman officials of this type, it fits the form exactly, exactly. <clears throat> the terms he uses, the greetings he uses are all exact. So either Luke is familiar with the, the genre in general, and someone has given him the basic import of it, and he kind of reconstructs it or he's actually seen it we don't know but it starts out as claudius lysias that's him the commander to the most excellent governor felix so this title most excellent is is uh you know just like there are titles in nobility there are titles in the church you know through the bishop your grace your eminence uh for priests etc most excellent was a specific title for someone of felix's class <clears throat> so and it was the correct title so normally most excellent uh, was uh, used for the equestrian class uh, among the Romans. In other words, the knight class. Now, Felix, we know historically, we, we know from historical books about this man, Felix, uh, who it seems governed here until about the year 59 or 60, and we're now about 58 probably. So Felix was an interesting character. He was not of, the noble, of this noble class, the equestrian class, um, by himself, but he managed to kind of wriggle, uh, wiggle his way into this appointment because he, his brother Pallas, was one of the most trusted advisors of uh, the Emperor Claudius. Claudius. Yeah. So he, and uh, this is all. These are all historical figures we know about from other sources. So Felix manages to get this position. He also seemed to have a very good ability to marry well. So. He, he married three times that we know of, and each of the three wives he had were princesses. And the last of which was a Drusilla, uh, who divorced her husband, um, uh, oh, oh, it was Herod's, one of Herod's um, grandsons, in order to um, become his wife. So she was, Drusilla was Jewish. So anyway, all right. Uh, so to the most excellent governor Felix, greetings. This man, Paul, was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them. Coming with the troops, I rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. So this part, you know, he, that's not, if you remember the story, it's not exactly the order it happened in. Uh, what happened was he, I mean, he makes it seem here, having learned that he was a Roman, I came to rescue him. Well, no, he came to rescue him because there was this big, you know, there was chaos breaking out. And so he grabs Paul to break, to just disperse the crowd. And then he's about to beat Paul without any kind of um, uh, judging, without any kind of trial. And then Paul reveals he's a Roman citizen. So it's not exactly how it happened, but he's kind of skimming over the details to make himself look better. And he has every reason to believe Paul's not going to, Paul's going to support him in this uh, because so far, Lysias, the commander, has treated Paul very fairly since that point. 
So 28, and when I wanted to know the reason they accused him, I brought him before their counsel. True. I found out that he was accused concerning questions of their law. So in other words, you know, this part is kind of dismissive. It, it, it was all a bunch of hubbub about some questions of their own internal law. In other words, we don't care. Totally of no interest to us. But had nothing charged against him deserving of death or chains. And when it was told me that the Jews lay in wait for the man, I sent him immediately to you and also commanded his accusers to state before you the charges against him. Farewell. So this is a very typical letter, very, you know, very Roman. And it was very short, very to the point. Boom, 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 boom. Here's what happened. And, and you can see the, the commander, Lysias, you know, once the boy comes to him with this information that there's a plot to kill Paul, it's almost like if I were him, I would be relieved. You know, he says, all right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get him out of here and I have a good excuse to send him on to my superior to bump the case up, you know, and get it out of my hair. Right. Cause there's, there's no winning for him in this situation. So why does he want to be involved in anymore? He wants to get rid of this guy. Let someone else, let him be someone else's problem. So now he has a great excuse to get rid of him because of this ambush. <clears throat> and he's, and he's going to tell the Jews, you know, if you want to, if you have a problem with him, don't bother me anymore. I've, I've kicked it upstairs to my boss. You have to go to Caesarea now and figure it out. 31. Then the soldiers, as they were commanded, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. So, the, okay, 32. The next day they left the horsemen to go on with him and return to the barracks. So, let's see here. Caesarea. Um, let's see. So here, right, he, he takes them to Antipatris. In other words, once they get to Antipatris, which is, you know, part of the way to Caesarea, uh, they're out of the Jewish territory, really. Now, from Antipatris onto Caesarea, it's mainly Gentile territory, although the city of Caesarea on the coast has a large Jewish population. So in other words, the, the uh, cavalry accompany them up, to, up through the most dangerous part through the middle of the night where the Jews were most likely to be laying in wait for him if they somehow had found out that, that they were evacuating him from the city. <clears throat> and then it was dangerous in general on the roads. It might not be someone who was knowingly looking for Paul. It might have been brigands who were, wanted to rob any caravan that was going through there. So they have the horsemen go to that point and then they return to the barracks because you wouldn't want you know, he's got perhaps half his soldiers out on this quick assignment. He doesn't want them gone too long. He wants them to get back. So, and some people say, well, why would they have sent so many soldiers? Well, uh, and they say, it's a kind of, well, you know, here the, the Bible's lying to us, you know, it's made up. Why would they have um, sent so many soldiers? But it's really not all that unreasonable. I mean, Luke might not know the exact number, but it's not that unreasonable. If you're told that there's at least 40 men who are waiting to ambush you, I mean, it seems reasonable to have, to send a couple hundred uh, men uh, to be in a defensive posture. And also the size itself would be such an overwhelming force that maybe the other people would reconsider their, uh, their choice to, to do this, which would amount to a suicide mission. Uh, all right. <clears throat> so 33, when they came to Caesarea and had delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. And when the governor had read it, he asked what province he was from. He asked uh, what province Paul was from. Now, why some people say, well, that seems like kind of an odd question. What he's trying to do here is he is following the normal Roman procedure. And actually this, all of Luke's description of the kind of legal procedures that the Roman officials used matches exactly with what we know from historical sources. <clears throat> so in other words, he's treating this as a legal matter. And he's saying, what province is this guy from? In other words, do I have jurisdiction over this guy is he a member of the area that i'm is he from the area that i'm a governor of and so it goes on to say and when he understood that he was from cilicia he said i will hear you when your accusers also have come and he commanded him to be kept in herod's praetorium so in other words he determines that he does have jurisdiction because at this time <laughs> the governor was the governor of judea and syria the province of Syria, which would have included, um, so you have Syria, which would have been up to the north and east, but also included uh, just a kind of around the corner 
uh, into what is now modern day Turkey to include Cilicia and Tarsus. It, it seems that that was the arrangement in this particular year 58. So he determines that he has jurisdiction. And so he says, okay, I'll accept the case. <clears throat> and um, he commands him to be kept. Again, he goes into this kind of protective custody, uh, awaiting trial, uh, waiting for the accusers to also travel from Jerusalem. All right. a, qu a quick question, what's a praetorium? The praetorium is uh, like a uh, fortress, I guess you could say like a fortress, you know, so um, where, where um, uh, you know, it, it talks about the praetorium in the um, passion accounts in the gospels when um, uh, Punch Pilate comes into town, into Jerusalem, he's staying at the praetorium. In other words, at this, at the, um, palace fortress the seat of authority that herod would have built for himself uh and so the the whoever's in charge stays there and it says remember like that the high the priests when they were going to accuse jesus and uh, jesus gets sent to uh to see pontius Pilate at the praetorium they refused to enter into the courtyard of the praetorium because they didn't want to be defiled and not be able to eat the passover because this was considered kind of gentile territory uh, so they would have been defiled by entering into the courtyard, entering kind of like the White House. Yeah, I would say something like more like a. Well, it was a headquarters. Headquarters, headquarters, headquarters I yeah. think of the. Yeah, so there would have been some kind of protections, and we actually know that we there's there are ruins in Caesarea of this Praetorium. I mean, Herod was Herod was well known for his um, building extensive building projects throughout all of this area of Judea. It's uh, a huge area, Father. I've been there several. Caesarea? You know, it's, it's huge when you see some of it. Yes, Caesarea. And it's, uh, it's uh, some of it is almost covered by the sea. You know, part of it is covered by the water of the Mediterranean. It's right on the Mediterranean. And if you start following the ruins, it was a huge area. Yeah. I'm One day maybe we'll go. Yeah, I would love to go. I didn't. I didn't go there when I was uh, in the Holy Land. Yeah, we should make a. We should make a trip. I sh I have pictures maybe on my phone. I'll I'll forward them to you all maybe. Yeah, but there's nothing from last trip. All right. Anybody have any questions? Excuse me. So we'll pick up. Um, let's see. Hmm. Next week, next week we're not meeting because I have to go to the clergy retreat. So in two weeks, we'll pick up uh, at the beginning of chapter 24. Sorry, I was late today. We were actually having a Zoom meeting with um, the bishop about uh, <laughs> developing a catechism project and it ran long, so. Uh, Father, in my footnotes, and this is not the Orthodox Bible, when it talks about the, the term his excellency, it says the word used in, it was also used in addressing Theophilus. When, uh, yeah. when Luke was writing to Theophilus in, in the beginning, when he is addressing this whole thing to, to the uh, most excellent Theophilus. Yeah. So um, he uses the same terminology as most excellent. So do we know if Theophilus, of course, there have been speculations whether he meant anybody who was a friend of God or right. to pertaining to all of us, or was it actually a person of excellency, uh, of, 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 uh, of, of, yeah, that's you know, a of prominent position? Great question. Yeah, Tokratisto here in the Greek, most excellent. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, it, it's still in the church and among nobility, they use these terms, you know, fairly precisely, uh, who's entitled to be called what, etc. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. We don't know really anything about this Theophilus that he addresses it to. There's a lot of speculation. Some people will say uh, that, and there is some evidence that this happened actually uh, other places, that, you know, for example, among the early Christian apologists stretching into the second century, the third century, they would address, they would write an open letter to the emperor, to like, there's one famous one to Marcus Aurelius, uh, defending Christianity, you know, supposedly, you know, it kind of takes the form of a response, almost like, you know, I'm responding to something, emperor's questions or something. Well, you know, the emperor probably hadn't even heard of Christianity, but it's, it was a kind of genre, it was a, 
it was a form that it took. So you were, you would address someone, you know, noble of importance so that other people would say, oh, oh, he's, you know, this is the kind of thing the emperor is reading. Let, let me, let me see. Uh, it was just kind of a form. So there's possible that he's just kind of used it as a form um, or, you know, and, and in order to show that, well, there are some Romans who are, you know, Romans of some nobility who are interested in Christianity. So why shouldn't you be? Um, some people say that it could be, a, you know, Theophilus could be like a metaphor for anyone who loves God. It could be a real person. We don't know. There, there's really no... Uh, I, there's no consensus, I would say. Okay. Father, a question about St. Luke. Do we have, are there other uh, writings of his that are not included in the approved text of scriptures that we have, the Septuagint? Do we know? No, not that we know of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just, just Luke Acts. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we do, we, we do, uh, I have a concerning the same thing. Now, we know St. John wrote other letters that were lost, right? Like a third letter that he first First and Second John, uh, was there not a letter that was lost? We do have Third John. One of the first, first. Uh, we have Third John. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, we we know that there are letters. For example, Paul is the easiest case because Paul, if you read uh, all of First and Second Corinthians and kind of piece together, as you know, Paul makes reference to, you know, I, I wrote you and then I visited you and then this happened. And if you, if you read just first, second Corinthians with no other information, which we don't have any other information, but you can tell that there are, there were more than two letters that, that Paul sent. There were, there were yes. at least four. So, uh, so then obviously there's, you know, letters that are missing. So, but some people, there's a very interesting argument actually that Second Corinthians um, is is not was not one letter. That Second Corinthians, I think it's almost certain, is composed of two separate letters that were at some point combined by copyists as they tried to uh, pass down and keep records of Paul's correspondence. But I think most people accept that there's at least one missing letter because Paul makes reference to its con content, um, the sorrowful letter. <clears throat> and it doesn't seem to fit with the content we have from Second Corinthians. So yeah, there definitely is, are some letters that were lost that probably would have been included in the New Testament had the church had access to them. Mm, very interesting. And who knows what parchment we might someday find in Sinai, like St. Catherine's or something that might have been forgotten from the fourth century. You know, I keep hoping something new would come up. <laughs> yeah, it would shed light. I mean, there's a lot of stuff we don't know. I mean, most a lot of like the book we're reading on the first century, uh, the religion of the apostles, you know, there's so much speculation about what was, what did the apostles do? What did the religious life of the apostles look like? And there's just so much we don't know about the first century, uh, which is why all these studies about second temple Judaism have proved really helpful because they get, they shed some light on the world in which the apostles were living, right? Otherwise, a lot of it is just speculation. And what's tend to happen is, as someone famous said, I forget, um, you know, each, each uh, church reads back into history what it wants to see, you know, <clears throat> so the Protestants will read back and, you know, there's no, oh, yeah. no authority structure, everyone's just sitting on the ground, four white walls, et cetera, <laughs> because that's what they're doing. So they want to see that as from the beginning, you know, the, the Catholics will look and see, well, you know, Peter was, was acting as the Pope. Um, but when something's vague and you don't have a lot of historical information, you can do that. You, you have to start interpreting and then you can read what you want to read into it. Father, I rec about the word convert. You know, Father, I didn't. Go ahead. Okay. About the word convert. I know that you used it or we read it in after we had the discussion in what we covered today. The, he, Paul went around converting these other, converting to, you know, yeah, we, we, word was used. yeah, we used it in terms of Trophimus. So there would be appropriate to use that term because the, the dispute there, which, which causes this whole chaos in Jerusalem now, <clears throat> is that uh, Trophimus is a Gentile. 
He's, he's not a Jew who's living in the diaspora, a Hellenized Jew living in the diaspora with a Jewish kind of ethnic heritage or something. He's a Gentile. He's a pagan um, who somehow becomes interested in Judaism. You know, perhaps he's one of these God fearers who was interested in Judaism. And then Paul comes with the message of Jesus as the uh, fulfillment of these uh, expectations of the Jewish people. And, uh, he, he converts to Judaism. Uh, he converts to a Judaism that believes in Jesus Christ. So that would be appropriate to talk about a conversion because he goes from paganism to, to Judaism. Now, Judaism that believes in Jesus, but still a Judaism. Uh, but it would not be appropriate to talk about, you know, there's a Hellenized Jew and then Paul goes into the synagogue, as we kept reading over and over again in Acts. He goes into the, uh, the synagogue, he's preaching to the Jews, and that they convert to Christianity. That would be very anachronistic, because they would simply, they're Jews who are awaiting the Messiah, and he says, hey, you know, the God has called me uh, to, to send to his people, just as he did to Isaiah, just as he did to Jeremiah, and that same God, Yahweh, has called me to proclaim to you that Jesus is the Messiah and Lord. Uh, your expectations have been fulfilled. Uh, I, yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. I, I did not know till yesterday, I have to admit my ignorance, that actually the rebuilding of the temple after the 70 years of Babylonian captivity uh, um, was considered the, 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 the second temple. Uh, I always, I, I thought they were repairing the temple, but the rebuilding of it was considered a second temple when Nehemiah went back uh, and Ezra, mm -hmm. father, I was kind of, uh, I didn't realize that was considered a second temple period. Yeah. Yeah. There, I mean, Are there, you with uh, me? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. There's some question about, you know, what what was left of the first temple. There, There's some question, but, but clearly, I mean, they, I think it's possible that they were able to use some pieces uh, of what remained from the first temple, maybe. Uh, that's not sure. clear to me, but it's it's significantly different. Okay, it's so the third temple would have been the temple of Herod? No, well, okay, that's confusing. Okay, so there, there's only two temples. So you have the first temple of Solomon, it's destroyed, um, and then it's rebuilt around, you know, the 500s by Nehemiah and Ezra. And then Herod expands the second temple. So it's a significant expansion. Uh, you know, he caught like a remodel, yeah. you know, an extensive remodeling where he expands, the, but it basically has to do with the temple mount and the area outside the temple. He expands it considerably, but the temple itself is the same, but maybe he's added decorations to it. He's added gates, he's added different courtyards, et cetera. He has leveled the area on top of the mount, uh, all that, but it wouldn't be considered a new temple, just renovated second temple. Okay, okay. Well, I'm glad to hear, to understand it. I mean, when they thank you, about, Father, thank you so much. When they talk about a third Go ahead. temple, they're talking about you will hear people mention a third temple, but that's that has to do with. Usually, it's not really Jews who are talking about building a third temple. It's it's Zionist Christians. The Zionist Christians. A third temple, so that the Antichrist can take up his throne there. Blah 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 blah. Yeah, they they they're setting the stage for Christ when so that that when they're ready, he should come. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You yeah. know what I'm saying? Because, in other words, yeah. they're dictating the future to God. <laughs> well, because they read it in certain uh, kind of off, offhand phrases in the scripture. And because in their mind, you know, the Bible is the source of authority and everything flows from the Bible. You know, the church flows from the Bible. Even God is handcuffed by the Bible. Whereas we say, no, 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 there's God. He, he comes to found a church, not a book. And then the church produces writings about its experience as God's new Israel. Yes. Yes. Um, I found recently another place that I'm very glad I found in but the book of Revelation <clears throat> in chapter 12, at the end of it, where it says that the dragon was after the woman and after the rest of her offspring. And she's talking about the Holy Mother, the rest of her offspring, 
are we. So she, we are her offspring as the Holy Mother. So that proves that we are, we call her a mother. You know, that's, that's just a point to argue with the non, non-Orthodox or the, the Western mind that she was our mother. You know, they don't accept her as that in the protestant tradition but it's there right there in 12 chapter 12 of revelation at the end yeah All Father, right. i have another question one more question about the vision stuff yeah and, and that that has to do with saint catherine because the story is that as a young maiden she she had a vision of christ yeah and that he handed her mm -hmm. a ring <laughs> now how does this work out good, good. That's <laughs> and, good. And, and 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 said you are you know i will be your only bridegroom etc mm -hmm. so and then they give they give that ring to visitors I'm, i received some of those rings when i when we were at saint catherine's monastery and in the church yeah that's true uh yeah the other kind of famous example more much more contemporary is with uh, saint irini chrysovalandu have you, you are you guys familiar with the, the saint saint irini chrysovalandu so she uh according to her life she actually was granted a, a visit into paradise uh in a vision and uh she was uh, she picked an apple from the tree in paradise and brought it back with her uh, from this vision, right? So, uh, you know, I don't know, I would hesitate to try to get, you know, too detailed into how exactly this happened and how exactly the ring, this material ring was given to her, et cetera. I mean, it, it, so the tradition also with St. Irini is that, you know, they're at the monastery, they say that they took the, the seeds from this apple and they planted apple trees and they give, as a blessing, they give apples to visitors that are grown there at the monastery. And the same with the rings, they, they made replicas of the rings that, that are blessed by being in the monastery and being prayed over and then they give them to visitors. Yeah, that's, it's, it's a mystery. I wouldn't get too technical about it. All right, guys. Enjoy it. Thank you, Father. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Father. All right. Thank you, Father. Nice job. Great job.